Hello and welcome to my presentation about post-quantum cryptography here at DragonCon. Let me start my talk with a quiz. It's a simple mathematics quiz. The question is, how much is 31 multiplied with 29? Well, this is not particularly difficult. The solution is 899. Uh, with a pocket calculator, this is even very easy. But now let's look at another quiz. It's a similar one, but this this time it's uh, the other way around. I'll give you a number and you need to tell me the two factors that need to be multiplied to get this number. The number is 851. And uh, one hint, the solution here is unique. Well, I guess you will see that uh, this question is a little more difficult than the previous one. Well, I'll give you the answer. The Two numbers are 23 and 37, and this solution is unique because these two numbers are prime numbers. So we are dealing here with a prime number product. And in the third quiz, I'm going to introduce now, um, you will have again uh, the task to derive the two factors that multiply to a certain prime number product. And here's the number. Well, of course, uh, this is a joke. This number is by far too long to uh, do uh, the job with a mental calculation. But I'll give you the solution anyway. Here are the two prime numbers um, that multiply with multiplied with each other re uh, result in this long number. And in fact, this is even the current world record in prime factorization, it's a 232-digit number or a 768-bit number. And of course, uh, the solution hasn't been found with mental calculation, but it has been found by a number of computers. And these computers uh, required a couple of years to find this solution. So prime number factorization is a very laborious task. And Especially the prime number multiplication is a lot easier than the, the opposite uh, calculation, the prime number factorization. That's the first message I want to uh, bring along in this talk. And even the best computer needs billions of years to factorize a 500 digit number, while it is just a matter of a second or less to do uh, the inverse computation the prime number multiplication. So why do I tell you this? Well, this uh, principle is used for the RSA crypto system. I'm sure many of you have heard of RSA and RSA is based on prime number multiplication. Well, uh, I can't explain how an RSA encryption works at the moment. Uh, that would be uh, uh, that's out of scope, but it's uh, important to note that RSA uses a public key, and this public key consists of a prime number product. This is used for encryption. It's publicly known. Everybody can use it. And there's also a private key Alice uses, and this one is secret. And the private key consists of two prime numbers. And uh, the, the concept is that, mm, the uh, like, like for all, public key encryption systems, it's possible to derive the public key from the private one, but of course not the other way around. And of course, in practical implementations, uh, the prime numbers are not 17 and 23, but we are dealing with, for example, 2048 bit numbers. So these are some basic facts about the RSA encryption system. RSA is used almost everywhere in the IT world. Uh, for example, virtually every smartphone uses RSA. Every or many ATM machines use RSA, and every web browser, every operating system, every email client. So this uh, encryption system is very uh, popular and very widespread. Probably used billions of times all the uh, times all around the world. And one thing that is also important to note, RSA cannot 
only be used for encryption, but also for digital signatures. So this is one what I wanted to say about RSA at the start of my talk. And now mm, let me introduce myself. My name is Klaus Schmee. I'm a German cryptography expert, a crypto history enthusiast, and book author and blogger. And one of my books is titled Code Breaking, a Practical Guide. Mm, it's a book uh, I co-wrote with Ilonka Dunin, who might be known to some of you. Uh, this book is not about post-quantum cryptography. It's about breaking codes from the last 500 years with modern means, with computer programs. Mm, if you're interested in cryptography and in code breaking, uh, it's certainly worthwhile to look at, uh, to take a look at this work. Let's now come back to our actual topic. And I say welcome to my first guest. And my first guest is a quantum computer. Well, as you can see here, a quantum computer looks quite different from uh, the computers we know today. And a quantum computer um, is based on quantum mechanics. Well, uh, I'm not a physicist, but I know that quantum me mechanics is uh, a kind of mechanics uh, that, that is uh, only valid for the smallest uh, building blocks of matter. And it works completely different from the mechanics we know in our everyday life. Um, one, uh, one example to visualize this is Schrödinger's cat. Uh, this cat is dead and alive at the same time. Well, of course, it's only a model. It's not a real cat, but it's dead and alive at the same time. But only as long as we don't look at it, uh, as soon as we look at the cat, only one of the two states is uh, valid. And uh, this principle is also used for the bit of a quantum computer, so-called qubit. So such a, a quantum bit or qubit has an interesting property. It can be zero and one at the same time, uh, something that is, of course, not possible in, in conventional mechanics. But in quantum mechanics, it's possible. And this allows for very strange uh, algorithms to be implemented, because if we look at a quantum byte, for example, which consists of eight quantum bits. Mm, we have eight bits uh, that can be zero and one at the same time, which means uh, that 256 uh, states can be um, acquired at the same time and uh, 256 computations can be performed in parallel. So that's quite a lot. And of course, if we have, uh, let's say, uh, 20 Q bits, that means that we have two to the 20 computations at the same time. So we, we have very many computations at the same time. The only problem is, uh, like with uh, Schrodinger's cat, as soon as we look at it, all the states except for one are lost. That means we have many computations, but only one result. And this is uh, basically how a quantum computer works. So what is a quantum computer good at? Well, it's good at executing many computations in parallel if there is only one result. So for example, finding an entry in a large list works quite well, or finding an optimal solution if there are many solutions available. Finding this one solution works because it's only one solution. It's, it's not possible with a, com a quantum computer, for example, to find 10 solutions at the same time. And what is a quantum com computer particularly good at? Well, it's really good at prime number factorization. Uh, why? Because uh, these parallel computations are extremely helpful for prime number factorization. For example, if we have 15, which is, of course, a prime number product, we don't have, uh, have to do serial computations, but we can basically do the factorization all at once uh, in one step. So in, in only one step, we learn that uh, the numbers 3 and 5 are the prime factors. And this makes um, the factorization process very fast if it's uh, computed with a quantum computer. And this is uh, probably the most interesting or the, the, the most uh, helpful 
uh, task a quantum computer can perform this uh, prime number factorization. And as I mentioned, prime number factorization is used by the RSA crypto system. So the question is, can a quantum computer break RSA? And the answer is yes, a quantum computer can break RSA within seconds mm, up to a key length of about five bits today. Well, remember that uh, uh, a typical key length of RSA at the moment is 2048 bits. So should be clear that we are still uh, in, in an early stage and that we're still far away from having quantum computers that can break practical RSA implementations. But of course, future versions of quantum computers might be more powerful. And who knows, maybe in 10 years, there will be quantum computers that can easily break RSA with 2048-bit keys. So if that happens, it would result in a disaster, of course, because as I mentioned, uh, RSA is used just about everywhere. And if it would be possible to break uh, RSA, just about every IT system would be at risk. So thank you for coming, Mr. Quantum Computer. Mm, I think the bottom line of this uh, first part is that a disaster threatens as long as we use RSA, mm, because one day it might be possible that RSA can be broken with a quantum computer. So we need to look at RSA alternatives that cannot be broken with a quantum computer. And these alternatives are usually referred to as post-quantum cryptography. And this is what this talk is about. So at the moment, there are mainly four families of post-quantum crypto algorithms that are relevant and that will play a role in this talk. The so-called lattice-based systems, code-based systems, hash-based systems, and isogeny-based systems. We are going to look at these. I also want to mention that there's a standardization competition organized or hosted by the NIST, a US standardization organization. This algorithm, uh, sorry, uh, this competition started in 2017. 69 algorithms took part in this beauty contest. And a few weeks ago in July 2022, the NIST announced the first four winner algorithms, which means that from 69 algorithms, four made it to the final group of winners. And there are, or there are four more methods that are being evaluated. So it's possible that there will be a few more winners in a year or so. And the goal is to have a portfolio of post-quantum algorithms, maybe five to 10 methods with a different, um, based on different uh, mathematical principles. And the first step of the, of the, of the competition has been, uh, is closed now, and we are now waiting for the next winners. I will come back to this competition during the presentation. And now let me introduce my next guest. My next guest is Mr. Snail. Sorry, he's a little slow. Mr. Snail can explain lattice-based crypto to us. Uh, just remember one of the four families I mentioned uh, is represented by the so-called lattice-based crypto systems. And uh, Mr. Snail can explain this to us. Well, actually, he calls it lettuce-based crypto systems. Uh, it's the same. It's only the, the way it is called by snails and by mathematicians. Mm, what mathematicians call a lettuce is called a lettuce field by a snail. A lettuce field consists of lettuce head. They are arranged on equidistant parallels that go into two directions, uh, just the, the way you see it here. And to define such a lattice field, we need the so-called base vectors. Uh, we are here in the two-dimensional space. This means that we have, um, by, uh, that we need two base vectors. We call them A and B. And uh, together they are called a base. And it's imp important to note that the same lattice, can, uh, lattice field can also be defined 
by, uh, by another pair of uh, vectors. Here we have C and D, and as you can see, A and B, the vectors on the left side are almost orthogonal. This is called the good base, and on the right side, these vectors are almost parallel. This is called a bad base. So good base and the bad base define the same lattice field, and this distinction is important, as we will see. Now let's look at the snail lattice problem. We assume that a uh, snail is placed somewhere in the lattice field. And now the question is, which lattice is closest to the snail? Well, of course, this is an important question because uh, the snail is always hungry, but it's also slow. So it really knows, uh, needs to know where the closest lattice head is. Uh, otherwise, it might even starve to death. The answer is quite easy in the two-dimensional case and, of course, also in the three-dimensional case. Uh, in, in this case, the um, lattice head with the red circle is the closest one to the snail. Mm, but it gets more difficult if we go to higher dimensions. Well, in our everyday life, we usually know three dimensions. So we have a first dimension usually denoted by the x-axis. We have a second dimension. Uh, represented by the y-axis, and then we have a third dimension represented by the c-axis. And this is uh, usually all we encounter in our everyday life. But in, mathemat in mathematics, it's easily possible to define more dimensions. For example, we can define a, a fourth dimension. Of course, uh, this is not, nothing we can really imagine, but it's something that can be defined, and it's possible to calculate with it or the fifth dimension, or we can even define a hundred different dimensions. Mm, as I said, there's nothing, uh, we, we, uh, this is nothing we, we can really imagine, but it's not uh, very difficult to do computations uh, with this uh, in, in these high dimensional spaces. So let's come back to the snail lattice problem. The question was which lattice is closest, and this is easy to answer in a low dimensional case. But what happens if we are in the 250 dimensional space? Well, in this case, um, there's a simple rule saying, if we have a good base, this question is still easy to answer. But if we only have a bad base available, it's very difficult. And well, one important fact uh, to add here is that it's always possible to derive a bad base from a good one, but not the other way round. And now we can define our first encryption scheme, the so-called Goldreich Goldwasser Halevi encryption, GGH. Mm, in this case, or for this system to work, we need a lattice field. Alice's private key is represented by a good base, and her public key is a bad base of the same lattice field. And if Bob wants to encrypt something, he puts a snail somewhere into the lattice field and the vector between the closest uh, lattice head and the snail is the, uh, the encrypted uh, or is uh, the message. So um, we are, if we are in the 250 dimensional space, uh, this means that we have 250 vector components. Um, that uh, we can use to encode the message. So this gives us uh, uh, the opportunity, for example, to encode a 128-bit key. So, and th this is sufficient for what we need. And if Bob has encoded the message this way, he sends it to Alice and with her private key, Alice can derive the closest uh, letters. Uh, and so she can decode the message. Everybody else has only a bad base available and without the bad base it's not uh, with the bad base it's not possible to uh, compute the closest uh, lattice and so the message cannot be deciphered this is like uh, how ggh works an attacker can't encrypt because he knows only a bad base so is ggh quantum proof the answer is yes is it secure the answer is no, because uh, GGH was broken a few years ago, not with a quantum computer, uh, but with a, an attack that is completely unrelated to this technology. But of course, it can't be used anymore. 
Uh, but uh, there are other Redis-based methods uh, that are still known to be secure, and these play uh, an important role in today's cryptography. And if we look at the NIST quantum, uh, post-quantum competition again, as I said, NIST had announced four winner algorithms, and three of these are lattice-based. So you can imagine that this family of crypto systems is very important. These uh, mm, these systems have names such as Crystal Skyver, Crystal Stilithium, and Falcon. Mm, the, uh, these crypto systems are still quite unknown, but I'm sure they will gain popularity in the near future because they will be standardized and probably used in practice. So thanks, Mr. Snail. And I now want to welcome my next guest. It's a rocket scientist. Well, Mrs. Rocket Scientist will explain code-based cryptography to us, and I can assure you this isn't rocket science well um, in, in some sense it is rocket science because we need to lead, uh, look at the rocket first so let's assume we have a rocket on its way from the earth to outer space and the rocket sends back um, messages encoded in zeros and ones and of course on such a long uh, way it might happen that an error occurs that a one is transmitted instead of a zero, or at least a one is received instead of a zero, although uh, a zero was transmitted. So how can we avoid this? Uh, well, one simple method is using parity bits. Uh, I'm sure you know parity bits. Mm, it simply means that uh, each byte consists of a seven bit payload and the eighth bit is set such that the number of bits uh, of bits in a word is even uh, so and if we have an error we see that we have an uneven number of ones in a byte and this indicates that we are uh, that an error has happened we don't know exactly where it is we only know the byte where it happened but at least we know that there has been an error is there another method yes we can use a three times code Mm, that means every byte is sent three times in a row. And if an error occurs, we can easily detect it and correct it because if the uh, respective or if the um, uh, corresponding bits of the three bytes don't match, we know that there's an error and uh, we even know where exactly it is if it's only one error. So let's look at these two error correcting systems again. On the one side, we have parity bits, and then we have the three times code. The parity bits represent the so-called error detecting code, because we can detect errors, we can correct them, because we don't know exactly where it happens. The three times code is even an error correcting code. That means mm, we, we can even correct an error, because we know exactly where it is. But of course, it's not very efficient. Uh, because uh, we have a large overhead, we need to send every byte three times. Uh, this doesn't make much much sense, so it's, it's of course a waste of bandwidth. So are there better error correcting codes than this one? And the answer is yes. Uh, to uh, look at these codes, we need uh, to look at matrices first. So in our, uh, or at least uh, in this talk, a matrix also cons uh, always consists of zeros and ones. And for example, if we have a, a three bit word and we multiply it with a three by seven matrix, we receive a seven bit word. Or for example, if we have an eight bit word, we multiply it with an eight by five matrix and we receive a five bit word. So these are typical matrix operations and this can be used for error correction codes uh, i don't want to go into detail uh, I, I don't I, I can't explain now how the error correction really works but um, some uh, basic principles uh, should become clear now so if uh, the rocket wants to send this five bit word to the base station it doesn't send it right away but instead it extends it to an 8-bit word by multiplying it with, an, with a 5 by 8 
matrix. And this uh, means that instead of the five bit word, the rocket sends an eight bit word to the earth. And uh, we, we can look at this scheme in a little more detail. If we have a five bit word, the rocket doesn't send it instead it extends it to an 8-bit word with a matrix multiplication, then it sends it. If errors happen, or let's say two errors happen here, then an error correction procedure needs to be applied by the receiver. This is possible. I don't want to go into details because it's a, a complicated algorithm, but it's possible. And so uh, the receiver gets back the correct 8-bit word and by a with an inverse matrix multiplication, he, he gets back the five-bit word that is actually transmitted. That means, although we have two errors in this procedure, the correct message has been received. And this is uh, why error correction codes are used. Okay, how many errors can be corrected by an error correction code? Well, that de depends on the overhead. If, uh, let's say, we use a 5 by 9 matrix, which extends a 5-bit word to a 9-bit word, we have an overhead of 4 bits. And uh, there's a rule that if we have a 4-bit overhead, two errors can be corrected. Or the rule in general is, if we have an n-bit overhead, this allows us for correcting n divided by 2 errors. That's um, important, or that, that's one of the basic uh, theorems of coding theory. Now you might ask, well, why is this relevant for post-quantum cryptography? Well, the, the reason is, um, if we look at large matrices, we can define an encryption system. So let's now look at a really large matrix. We have a 5,000 by 7,000 matrix, which can be used to extend a 5,000 bit word to a 7,000 bit word. And uh, as we have uh, an overhead of 2,000 bits, this means that 1,000 uh, errors can be corrected. The only problem is this is extremely laborious and it lasts billions of, of years because we need an error correction algorithm um, that finds these up to 1,000 errors and this algorithm is complicated and very time-consuming and this is why it's... Uh, in practice, it's simply not feasible to do these up to 1,000 error corrections. But there are exceptions. Uh, a few matrices are known mm, with uh, special properties uh, that work uh, for, error, for uh, uh, easy error corrections. And um, such a, a matrix that allows for efficient error correction is also referred to as a good matrix. And most or the vast majority of matrices that are uh, that exist are bad matrices. Only very few are good that allow for efficient error correction. So um, we have a good matrix here, and this one can be turned to a bad one by multiplying it with two so-called blend matrices, and the result is a bad matrix. And this is finally what we need to. Uh, define an encryption system, the so-called McAllis encryption. In the McAllis encryption system, Alice's private key consists of a good matrix and two blend matrices, and the public key consists of the bad matrix. And now the question is how, how this can be used for encryption. Well, if Bob wants to send something to Alice, he first um, uh, uh, creates a plain text consisting of, let's say, 5,000 5, bits. Then he extends it to a 7,000 bit word with a bad matrix. The bad matrix is Alice's public key. Then he uh, in, uh, inserts errors at random. Uh, let's say, well, uh, we, we have an overhead of 2,000 bits, so he can add up to 1,000 errors uh, and it still can be deciphered or uh, detected. And then he sends the result, well, the uh, 7,000 bit words, including the errors to Alice. And Alice uh, now receives the cipher text. She knows that, that there are errors in the cipher text. She doesn't know where, but she has a, a good matrix. So she can use an error correction procedure that is quite 
efficient, then so within a short time frame, she can um, correct the errors and then use uh, the good matrix to get back the plain text consisting of 5000 bits. And this is how Mac Ellis encryption works. An attacker needs to find these errors that were inserted by Bob with a band matrix, which is uh, difficult or even impossible. Alice has a good base and she can do it a lot faster. If we compare Mac Alice with RSA, we see there are some similarities. As mentioned, the private key of RSA re is represented with uh, two prime numbers. The public key is the prime number product. Mac Ellis uses um, a good matrix and two blend matrices for the as the private key, and the public key is uh, represented by the resulting bad matrix. This is the Mac Ellis encryption scheme. How long is a public key of a Mac Ellis encryption scheme? Well, this is uh, really a problem. It's usually about one megabyte. So remember that uh, RSA only uses 248 bits. So 248 bits compared to one megabyte. Of course, there are orders of magnitude in between. And this is why uh, the McEllis uh, uh, crypto system, which is about uh, uh, 40 years old or, or even older, has never been very attractive. So the keys are simply too long. It's, it's known to be secure and performant, but the keys are too long. So it has never been used in practice. But now as we need replacements for RSA that are quantum proof, this may change. And if we look at the post quantum competition again, um, as I said, the NIST has announced four winners and four methods that are currently, be, uh, currently evaluated. The three of the algorithms currently evaluated are code-based, which means that they are similar to McEllis. And these systems are classic McEllis, Bike, and HQC. All of these have long uh, keys, so they are not very uh, practical to use or not very convenient. But anyway, they are quantum proof. So thanks for coming, Miss Rocket Scientist. Let me now uh, introduce my next guest, Mr. Island Salesman. So he is going to tell us a little bit about his work. Um, well, recently he wanted to sell an island to Alice. And Alice said, yes, I would like to buy an island. But before I purchase it, I want to look at it. So she took an airplane, flew to the island, looked at it and made her decision. And before all this happened, uh, she and the island salesman agreed upon a protocol that said she would send either a yes or a no. Yes means I buy, no means I don't buy. Uh, the only problem about this protocol is both can cheat. Alice can send a yes and later say it was a no or the other way around. And of course, the island salesman can say, I received a yes, though it was a no or the other way around. So basically, uh, the two need some kind of signature scheme. So here's uh, what they can do. Well, Alice can leave behind two safes uh, with a combination lock each. And safe number one contains a statement signed by Alice and this statement says, yes, I buy. And the second safe contains a statement saying, no, I don't buy, of course, also signed by Alice. And when Alice has made her decision, she sends either combination one or combination two to the island salesman. And if it's combination one, it's a yes. And uh, the salesman can open the safe and then he has a written statement in his hand uh, um, and a signed statement saying that Alice is going to buy the island. And of course, uh, if safe two is, if he opens safe two, it's the other way around. It's a signed no statement. Alice's private key in this case is the pair of combinations. The public key is represented by the two safes and their content. One special property of this protocol is that Alice needs to publish half of her private key. 
And of course, each uh, private key can only be used once. So if she wants to send several bits, uh, she needs to leave behind more than one pair of saves. Now the question is, is there also a digital version of this protocol? And the answer is yes. In this case, Alice doesn't leave behind two saves, but she leaves behind two hashes of random numbers. Uh, random number one uh, is, uh, stands for yes, random number two stands for no. And when she has made her decision, she either sends um, random number one or random number two, and uh, the salesman can check if, for example, random number one, when hashed, really leads to the hash he has uh, available. And if it's random number two, again, he uh, checks if the hashing function delivers the hash that was left behind by Alice. And of course, again, um, or Alice's private key is here represented by the two random numbers. The hashes are her public key. And um, again, Alice needs to publish half of her private key, which is very unusual for a crypto system, but it, this is the, the case here. And again, this scheme can be only used once for one bit. If Alice wants to sign more than one bit, uh, she needs to leave behind more pairs of hashes. So you might say this looks pretty laborious because all this uh, I showed you is just for signing one bit or she needs to leave behind more hash values, uh, which is uh, not, not very efficient. Um, so yes, uh, this method is a little complicated, but there are ways to improve this method. Uh, but anyway, in spite of all these improvements that are possible, hash-based signatures have either long signatures or long keys or both, or it's a trade-off. If you have long signatures, it takes long to verify or to create a, a signature. Well, basically, um, these uh, hash-based signatures are not especially uh, convenient to use, but they work and they are considered very secure. And most of all, they are considered quantum. Proof. Let's look again at the NIST competition. Um, among the first four winners that have been announced, there is one, um, one hash-based system and it's named Sphinx Plus. It's a hash-based digital signature scheme. So thanks, Mr. Island Salesman. And Let's now come to our last guest. Our last guest is Mr. Craftsman. And Mr. Craftsman will tell us something about isogeny-based cryptography. Well, um, isogeny-based cryptography is actually about, or the, the foundation is about elliptic curves. Uh, you might have heard about elliptic curves. There are even uh, crypto systems based on elliptic curves. All this uh, doesn't play a role here. Uh, in this case, elliptic curves are used in a completely different way. They are used to build a maze. Uh, of course, this maze is a lot larger than you can see here. But basically, uh, these mazes uh, produced from these elliptic curves have very in in interesting properties. For example, jumping from one room to the other has some similarity with the power function. Well, uh, of course, uh, this is a little simplified now, but basically, if we have a room R in this maze, and uh, we can do um, uh, seven jumps, we, we can uh, call this uh, so we can call this R to the seven. And now. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange before. And such a Diffie-Hellman key exchange is exactly what Alice and Bob can do when they have an isogeny-based uh, maze they can use uh, for a key exchange. They start at the room R. So Alice's private key, let's say, is seven. So she does seven jumps. Bob's private key, let's say it's three, so she, uh, he does three jumps. And these special properties of this uh, maze uh, based on uh, elliptic curves um, makes it possible that um, if Alice sends her R to the seven, 
uh, jump collection to Bob and Bob sends his R to the three jump sequence to Alice, they can um, use it like a, a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So if uh, Alice takes R to the three and takes it to the seven, she receives R to the 10. And in a similar way, if Bob takes R to the seven from Alice and computes R, uh, the, or takes the result to the three, he also um, re receives R to the 10. So both of these, uh, both of them uh, receive the same path in this um, maze. And this is why they have, uh, and they, they can use this path as a key and it's secure because uh, the logarithm that need, needs to be computed um, in order to, to learn uh, the, the steps the two perform is, is very difficult to compute. So basically, it's, it's a Diffie-Hellman system in a, uh, a completely different environment than is usually known. And doing it in this environment is quantum or makes it a quantum proof system. So R10 is the key here they have in common. Okay, now uh, one brief look at the competition again. Um, among the four more methods currently being evaluated in uh, the, the next step of the competition, there is one um, isogeny-based system. It's called Psych. And well, just a few hours uh, before this talk was recorded, I read on a web portal that this quantum uh, post-quantum algorithm psych has been broken. So as I said, it's just a few hours ago that I learned about it. I can't say much about it. My impression is uh, that this system now will be kicked out of the competition. But of course, it's too early to really comment on this. Perhaps uh, the, the problem can be fixed and perhaps uh, the algorithm will stay in the competition. Uh, when you see this uh, presentations in a uh, presentation in a few weeks. Uh, I'm sure more information will be available, and uh, of course, it's an interesting question if Psych will stay in the competition or if it will be kicked out. And if it will be kicked out, I guess uh, that Psych uh, or that uh, isogeny-based encryption systems won't play a role anymore, at least in the near future. So thanks, Mr. Kratzman. So that's pretty much it. I've introduced four families of post-quantum crypto algorithms that are relevant, the lattice-based systems, the coast-based system, the hash-based and the isogeny-based systems. It's well possible that uh, the, the isogeny-based systems won't play a role anymore depending on the new developments. But anyway, up to now, there are still these four families. I assume that we will see a couple of systems of this kind implemented in practice, mainly the ones uh, that did well in the NIST competition. And if, apart from that, mm, we will see what happens. Of course, it's always possible that something new or some new attacks are detected and this will change everything, but we will see what happens. So all I can say, uh, to conclude this session, uh, thanks for watching and goodbye.